There we go. All right. Hello, everyone. This is Erica Orient from the Michigan Center for Student Success. We'll go ahead and get started. Thanks for joining us today. Um, today, we are focused on supporting independent institutions to join the My Transfer Pathways. Um, Donna Petrus, my colleague at MCCA, has been providing a lot of customized support to institutions, but we also had these workshops available that, that kind of provide the big picture overview. I know several of you who are on this call are, are very familiar with the pathways, um, but I would also encourage you to use this information information to share with your colleagues across campus um, to learn more about the project that we're doing um, and answer, you know, at, use it as a framework to be able to talk about the work you'll be asking them to do as well. Um, next slide. Uh, so I'll just go over our agenda. We'll focus, we'll start with welcome and introductions. Um, I'd like to provide an overview of the My Transfer Pathways. Uh, the benefits and requirements to for institutions to participate, uh, the various different options, uh, the components of the agreement, uh, the protocol that we use to manage, oh, I don't know, what, 70 institutions to participate in these agreements across 10 agreements, um, thanks to Donna's uh, focused effort to keep all of that organized, and then we'll talk a little bit about next steps. Uh, so for welcome and introductions, we're a small group, um, and so it would be terrific if folks would introduce themselves who are on the call. Um, I'll go ahead and start with my, our colleagues at MICU, and I'll start with Colby Cesaro. Hi, everyone. I'm Colby Cesaro. I'm the Vice President at Michigan Independent Colleges and Universities. Thanks, Colby. Shannon? Hey, everyone. My name is Shannon Donovan, Director of Member Services at MICU. Thanks so much for being here today. Uh, Nicole? I'm Nicole Crock. I am the registrar at Kalamazoo College, and I apologize for not having my video on. I'm actually on vacation today, so I'm not looking all the greatest. Oh, <laughs> I'm sure you're looking great. And thank you for joining, even though you're on vacation. Mary? Hi, everyone. I'm Mary Roberts. I'm from Siena Heights University, and I work with adult transfer students in our SHU Global program. So I'm just curious to see what you guys are talking about today. We, we do a vast array of transferring of credit already and just looking to see if there's something different out there that I should be aware of. Great. Thank you. Rachel? Uh, my name is Rachel Cush, and I am from Calvin University, and I work with our transfers here. Great. Uh, Jared, we're doing introductions. Sorry to put you on the spot. I know you just joined. Uh, just your name, institution, and what role you have. I may have really put you on the spot. <laughs> Sorry, my mic's not working. I'll oh. have to do it a little bit later. I apologize. Oh, okay. Sounds yeah. good. Thanks for joining. Okay, next slide. Um, so I want to uh, start our little overview here at the beginning to um, recognize our funders who have supported this work. Um, we are working with the Teagle Foundation and the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations, um, who are working with uh, Michigan uh, through the independent colleges and universities and the Community College Association and a number of other states as well um, in their efforts to um, improve transfer pathways between community colleges and independent institutions, particularly in the liberal arts. Um, we have worked with MICU, at, speaking for the MCCA, we've worked with MICU for many, many years on our transfer initiatives. And we were excited when we were contacted by Teagle about the opportunity to continue this partnership um, and really uh, provide very Direct, direct and specific support to meet the needs of independent institutions in Michigan. So thanks to our funders and, and certainly thanks to uh, Maiku for being willing to partner with us on this. Uh, so I wanna provide a bit of an overview of the MyTransfer Pathways. Uh, this uh, 
this project uh, was, uh, we started this project in uh, before 2017. Um, and when we really recognized an opportunity to leverage the Michigan Transfer Agreement, which is Michigan's general education package of transfer courses, um, we wanted to leverage that so that students had a better sense of what program specific courses they should take in their first and second year. So I think we all know working in higher ed that the conventional wisdom that going to community colleges and getting your gen eds out of the way, not only does it not provide students those enriching experiences in program specific courses in the first couple of years so that they are really getting engaged with the content and feeling confident in their selection of a major, but we also know that that's actually not how universities are advising students now. Students are taking uh, courses, program specific courses in their first and second year so that they're ready for upper division courses when they're juniors. In addition to that, of course, we know that students are also taking gen eds in the third and fourth year as well. So um, that was sort of the idea behind this. And then knowing that uh, the data that we had showed that um, Michigan is one of those states that has a variety of different transfer pathways. So we're not the kind of state where students in one community college are very likely to go to one specific university or a vast majority of students. We actually find in our state that community college students go to um, in many cases, all 28 community colleges send students to all 15 public universities and more than half of the independent colleges in just one year. So there's so many different options that we wanted to do this together as a state. So what we did is we already had identified the Michigan Transfer Agreement. Oh, can you go back one? Sure. Um, we had already, oh, actually this is a good slide. Um, we have already identified the Transfer Agreement courses through the MTA. We worked with Dozens and dozens, I think we ended up having 800 people at our meetings to identify the My Transfer Pathways courses, which were the courses that were required, recommended, or optional at every university in the state of Michigan. And then each university uh, also recommended additional courses that they suggested that students take in their first and second year. Those three boxes up there together represent the associate degree. And then, of course, students will be able to transfer all three of those boxes over to the university to complete their bachelor's degree requirements. I think on the next slide, Donna has um, just sort of outlined um, what I, we just looked at graphically. Um, and students can meet degree requirements in a very strategic way at both of those institutions. Um, so what are the benefits of this? Um, I think that there are really significant benefits to both community colleges and universities in addition to students, um, but we're providing clearer pathways to complete the bachelor's degree. And I think that those key courses, those four or five courses uh, in each of these programs that every university was requiring um, really gives students that foundation and the discipline that they need. Um, it really helps to support enrollment goals at institutions. Um, there is a sense, a better sense of what our transfer pathway pipelines are. I, I would probably argue that those, based on the data that we see, those pipelines have, were significantly disrupted by COVID, um, but I'm hoping we can get back to um, sort of more what we see is what we historically have seen or see more normal transfer patterns where students are willing to relocate to other institutions. And then I think the other terrific thing for especially the independent colleges that are on this call is the opportunity to join a project that includes lots of institutions across the state um, one of the things that we know we hear from transfer students and from people at community colleges that have advised transfer students is the more consistent universities can be um, in terms of their practices, the more likely it is that a student is to complete. They're not, they're not uh, figuring out each individual different way of being able to um, structure their coursework to be able to transfer to these institutions to your institutions. And so I think that, that that sort of similarity has a lot of benefit 
for all of us um, to be able to more uh, make it easier for students to understand how to transfer. I want to add a little bit to that, Erica. So from our perspective at the association level, it's important for us to be able to communicate to both the public and the legislature that the private institutions in Michigan are aligned with the goal of increasing attainment in the state. And we can do that by participating in programs like this, even if the uptake is mm -hmm. not an order of magnitude percentage of your enrollment, it may still be really meaningful for the few students that otherwise wouldn't have looked at your institution and end up being really successful there. And as Erica noted, students that transfer to independent institutions are really successful, especially in the liberal arts fields. And the more that we can promote that, even if it is a couple, just a couple of students that who otherwise would not have looked at your institution, that's gonna be really meaningful for them. And as far as the legislature goes, we like to be able to say that, we would like to be able to say that all of our institutions participate in these. And we do so voluntarily because we believe it's in the best interest of students and for the community at large rather than for the public universities, they're mandated to do it. They have to, in order to get state appropriations, they have to do this. Mm -hmm. And we're not in that position, thankfully, right now. Our institutions can do it voluntarily and many do it voluntarily because it it is in the best interest um, of, of their institution and sort of the broader communication goal. And mm -hmm. you know, that's not to say it's not a heavy lift, especially for those that aren't in certain programs yet. It just, um, it really is meaningful uh, for both our work with the legislative agenda and also with just a broader community support for increasing attainment. Mm -hmm. Thanks for adding that, Colby. Um, I'll, I'll just, I, I, I forgot to mention, um, Col I'm, I'm doing this for the benefit of Colby because she's a real data geek, um, but speaking of transfer students being successful, um, I don't know if if you all have um, used the new college scorecard yet, um, they have a fabulous new website that's really easy to navigate. Um, and one of the things they do is uh, report outcomes after eight years after attending. Um, and they're using the outcome measures from iPads if, if you're a iPads reporter. And I just looked up one of one uh, independent institution in Michigan and at that particular institution, among students who started college at this institution, 44% graduated. Among students who transferred in, 78% graduated. Um, and we're, uh, at, your, at all institutions, you're actually able to um, disaggregate that by Pell Grant recipients as well. So we're not talking about an insignificant number of students who, who, who who is, are benefiting from these transfer pathways. Um, we're talking about, you know, twice as many students are graduating um, once they transfer in. So congratulations to those of you who do this transfer work at universities. What you are doing is working um, because if they reported graduation rates for transfer students, um, they look very good. So um, I think all of that is very good news. Um, so before I turn it back over to Donna, the last slide I want to talk about is, um, so what are the MyTransfer pathways? So through the grant project that we have funded by uh, Sendia, or no, <laughs> different funder, by the <laughs> Teagle Foundation and the Arthur Vining Davis Foundation, we would like to support institutions that offer programs in art, biology, communications, criminal justice, and psychology. We have five other programs that aren't really strictly in the liberal arts, although you all probably know that's a little bit of contested if you are in the liberal arts or not. Um, and we're happy to have institutions join those pathways as well. Uh, these 10 pathways were chosen uh, because they represent uh, some of the most popular major, popular bachelor's degree programs in Michigan. So of course we had hundreds of programs to choose from, but the reason that we chose these programs is because they're some of the largest majors where students get a degree. 
Um, I know that at least the community colleges would love to do more pathways, but I feel really good that we were able to select programs where we have you know, a, a, a significant number of the 50,000 um, degree, undergraduate degree recipients, bachelor's degree recipients in Michigan reflected in these pathways. And with that, I think I can turn it back over to Donna. Thank you, Erica. As a segue into some of the detail that I'm going to talk about, I also wanna emphasize that these 10 pathways weren't launched all at once. We have learned as we've gone. So one benefit to all of you is the fact that we've kind of worked out all the, the kinks and the problems. And so we have a really good system and a really good process that, that seems to work really well for institutions to participate. So we actually did this in three phases. And um, as we've gone along, more institutions have, you know, gone back and even joined, you know, some of the pathways in phase one that they hadn't initially um, joined. So it, it's not an all or nothing is what I want to emphasize. You can start with one or two pathways, um, learn the process. I can help you learn that process. And then as we go on, we can add more and more um, in terms of working with your faculty. It's also beneficial if you start with one or two um, help them understand the process and the benefits, and then we can work on the others. So the, the agreements themselves, I just wanted to kind of break it down for you a little bit, and you can certainly go out and look at these. Um, I've provided the link there at the bottom, and you can go out and look at these. Um, some of the agreements, I would say probably the average length of these agreements is about 75 pages. So it's it's a lot of information. Not all of it is um, specific or pertinent to what you might be looking at, but we just wanted to kind of go over the components. Um, pages one through 11 is kind of the meat um, where it's like there's a cover page. Um, as we've gone, we've added actually a join, modify, leave summary in terms of um, as institutions join at the different cycles, we've been able to add some of that information. The agreement terms, the list of participating institutions, appropriate e-signatures, that kind of information. Um, and then the different appendices go into much more detail. So here's a sample of the um, join, modify, leave kind of summary. Um, again, it updates for each cycle that we've gone through. Um, and those cycles come uh, twice a year, one in the fall and one in the spring. Um, it denotes the institution that is either joining or changing their information. Um, It'll designate that. Um, Appendix A is specific to the community college worksheet. Appendix B is the university worksheet. Appendix C is what we would, um, which I will show you in detail, kind of where that equivalent, those equivalencies lie and when there's exceptions, which is Appendix D. Um, something that um, also happened is we've, the agreements were good for three years when we initially started this project. And we've gone through that entire three-year cycle and in 2022 was the first year that these agreements were up for renewal. Um, the real positive thing, and I think Eric and I were both very excited to find this to be true, is no one dropped out because they weren't helpful to students. No one decided to leave because it was too much work for their institution. No one decided to leave um, because it, they just didn't think it was beneficial. Only one institution left and that was because their curriculum changed significantly that it just didn't make sense for them to participate any longer. There was really, it was more of a, a disadvantage for students to try to follow that pathway than if they were just to drop it completely. So out of all of the agreements we've you know, secured over the last three years, only one institution dropped one program. So I think that speaks to, again, as we've learned, as, as we've kind of tweaked some of the issues as we've gone along, it, it really does work well. So this is an Appendix A. It includes information about the institution, the program, the credits required. It speaks to the MTA component. Um, the pathway courses that you see, and I, the example that I showed you is for psychology. It will The worksheet already has inserted the four pathway courses. And then as you fill out a worksheet, you would fill in some of that detail, the subject and the course number, the title, the credit hours, et cetera. Um, and then at the bottom, there's um, an opportunity to talk about remaining degree requirements, as well as advising notes. Advising notes was something we added a little bit later. Um, so some of the earlier worksheets don't have that, but we felt that that was important because it seemed like institutions were trying to explain that somewhere and they didn't have an opportunity to do that. So we wanted to make sure that was added. 
again, the, the real focus is to try to make sure there's no gray areas when advisors are talking to students or maybe students are looking for information. There's just, we tried to make it as clear as possible. So what's important for the community colleges is to make sure they include those other additional remaining degree requirements for the associate's degree. So that's where those courses are listed. And then at the very bottom could be transfer electives to get to that 60 credit or 62 credit kind of number. And that's what that shows there. Appendix B is very similar, but just a little bit different in terms of how they're used for the four-year institutions. It also includes the general information at the top for the credits required for the degree, the MTA information, the transfer pathways courses. And if you think about the equivalency, if you think about kind of that matrix, that community college course is going to equate to what you see here on that four-year worksheet, um, course to course. Um, then the remaining degree requirements in terms of what the student must take at the transfer destination, and then again, any other advising notes. So this is very busy. Don't try to you know, look at it in detail, but this is just an example of what that course equivalency matrix looks like. The green box shows a direct equivalency. It's a course to course equivalency. Down the left-hand side is the community college and across the top are the participating four-year institutions. Now we also have something that, and it shows the actual course. Now, something that we have found over time is sometimes there's exceptions where an equivalency is not possible. And that's what that gray box is. And that's where it's captured in Appendix D. Now in the agreement itself, there is some manual um, work that is done to customize what you would see as a download directly from the MTN. And that's where I go in and I say, you know, insert things like see Appendix D. If you look at this matrix as a report on the mitransfer.org, it pulls directly from the MTN. This isn't something I create in Excel. This isn't something you should create as a standalone because it's a dynamic database. It can change every day. It can change multiple times a day. So this information in the report functionality actually pulls directly from the MTN. And that's important to remember when we talk about the requirements. This is a list um, of an example of Appendix D, which is the exceptions. Now, keep in mind, we don't simply want to have you say, well, we just don't like that course. We're looking for detail in the explanation. We don't simply want uh, the explanation to say, well, we just don't accept the course. And the reason for that is if the four-year institution can provide detailed information as to why a course is not equivalent, that really helps the community college evaluate that course. If it's a common exception, and it's because that community college doesn't include a component within their learning outcomes, that can be a trigger for that school to go back and say, maybe we need to revise our syllabus. Maybe we need to look at adding this component so it is more transfer friendly. So this is really meant as a tool to help people evaluate what they can do differently or do better. However, in some cases, there just needs to be an exception. And I guess one example I can give you is art. Some four-year art programs require a certain number of actual um, uh, time within hands-on and contact hours. And if that isn't there, then they might not include the, the exception of a course. And so those things are detailed in the exceptions. The other thing that I want to mention is we really try to make sure that the four-year institution in their explanation provides um, feedback related to if it's not if, the, if it's not a course to course equivalency, is it is it general elective credit? Is it credit towards um, graduation requirements? We don't want it to be lost credit. We really need to emphasize that it's either um, a direct um, equivalency or if not, then it's a general elective credit or it's just general transfer credit. But that's kind of the, the last and the list of priorities in terms of the exceptions. So one of the things, again, as we learned as time went on, was to provide a tool for everyone to follow kind of a process. So there's a really useful tool out there called the MI Transfer Pathways Protocol. I provided the link for you there. And it um, details exactly what needs to happen when with an explanation. 
the protocol itself, um, I did a, just a couple of different screenshots. Um, I didn't necessarily want to include the entire thing out there for you, but um, I showed you the contents, which includes information for community college as well as universities um, to join or modify. It also includes um, another project that we're working on related to Michigan workforce pathways. Um, and that's a totally different subject that we can discuss if you're interested. Um, and then it also, um, we've just recently added the leading component because again, we went through that first three-year cycle. On the right side, I'd included um, kind of information about what you can read there if you wanted to join a pathway. So it, it kind of, you know, you complete the worksheet, you notify community colleges that you're, you're going to be joining this pathway, you submit signatures, et cetera, and you go through this entire process. It also includes the deadlines for the fall cycle as well as the spring cycle. So any of you who would like to join starting this fall, keep in mind that November 1st deadline. What needs to be submitted by November 1st is your kind of your intent to join. And I can go through that in a minute as well. There's certain criteria that we need to make sure are submitted, which includes the worksheet as well as the signatures. And then after that date, we can work together on looking at the equivalency, seeing where the gaps might be, how then you would get information to work with a community college to make sure you do have a direct equivalency. Um, so just keep in mind that November 1st deadline for fall. And again, it, all the, the detail doesn't need to be finalized by then. It's really just at least submitting information of your intent to join. So I'm gonna pause here for a second and see if you have any questions, if you want to ask, um, provide some feedback um, and you know, whether it's myself or Erica or Colby or Shannon that can answer that, we'd be happy to do that. Donna, I fielded a couple questions in the chat. Um, oh, thank you. That's okay. If you can um, open the uh, website, uh, the My Transfer website, and kind of kind of show that navigation of of where how we how we add the agreements. Um, where we say like full agreement as of July 2022, just just so we can see what that navigation looks like. Sure. Because there's a, you want there's me to a go place, in, yeah. Do you want me to I go into the dashboard or just here? I would say, um, why don't we go to the transfer your associate degree first to the student facing information? Because of course we have student facing information and then faculty facing information. And uh, can you expand art or biology? Mary was asking. So as you can see with art, there are, uh, they, they list, we list all the community colleges who are participating. Donna, do you want to walk through that and like what, sure. what it means when a, when a college yeah. has a highlighted text or not? Of course. Thanks. Um, one thing that we thought was very useful for students is to encourage institutions once they join a pathway is to list information on their website or link back to their own institutional website in terms of, okay, so the student wants to get involved. Who can they contact at the institution? What other detail might be student facing that would be helpful? So what we did was these are the participating institutions that have signed an agreement and broken out by community colleges, public universities, as well as independent colleges and universities. The linked, the, the blue that indicates a link actually indicates that that, web, that institution has added information on their website. If it's black or not linked, that means that institution does not have any additional information on their website. So for the purposes of having an independent college and university example, if I click on the College for Creative Studies, you'll see it takes me to their website and then it takes me to information about the pathways. So they actually have separate information out here. Of course, CCS is really only focused on art. So they only participate in one pathway. Um, but it also has their MTA information as an example, the actual pathway information itself, um, their transferology, which I believe is part of their um, equivalency, internal equivalency database. 
And then if you have more information, they've actually included um, a contact link here. So to, you know, contact someone, ask questions, set up a meeting, et cetera. Hey, Donna, Mary wanted to know where to find Appendix C and, and how uh, the different within the PDF document. Can you, can you sure. drive yep. to that? Yeah. Yep. So um, under faculty and staff, technical resources, there's three options here. One that talks about the MTN or the Michigan Transfer Network, which is the equivalency database. One that talks about the Michigan Transfer Agreement and then one about the Michigan Transfer Pathways. The information, um, we wanted to make sure information wasn't um, the first click that, that um, like students would get to, but also make it available to people who might not have a sign on to the system to be able to get to this information. So there's a separate faculty and staff category. You go to that page. Within this first paragraph, there's an actual video that you can watch that explains much of what we're talking about today. If you need to go back and refresh and kind of, kind of take a look at that again, I referenced the protocol, which is right here, that provides the detail and the steps and the timing and the deadlines. One other thing I wanna point out is we've assembled a list of transfer liaisons. And many of you are a part of this already, but if you're an institution that needs to find a syllabus, or maybe you need a first day handout, more detail um, from a community college course to evaluate for an equivalency, and, and I'll show you in a minute, if it's not already loaded in a place where you can get to it, that liaison list will provide you a contact with an email address to give you kind of that person to, to go to versus trying to like hunt and peck on their website. So this is a really useful tool. And I think that's probably one of the best things we've ever done actually is to do that <laughs> listing for everyone. Because we would get a lot of, you know, who can I call, who can I contact? And so now that resource is available online. So if I go back to art, what we've listed here is the full agreement and we've listed them historically, the first time we launched and then every review cycle that we have gone through, we list that updated agreement verbatim. So the history is always there. So we have a sense of what happened when and who joined when, et cetera, or who changed information at what particular time. And then there's also this list of filterable spreadsheets exceptions, um, but that's also contained in the agreement. So if I go out to look at the July, 2022 update, which would have been the spring 2022 cycle, As we described in the slides, this is the cover page. This speaks to the summary of what's happened when in terms of updates. So in, in fall of 2020, we had these institutions either modifying or joining. 2021, this occurred, et cetera. And as I mentioned in um, 2022, that was the first time we were going to have a potential institution leave. And it was actually um, Lawrence Tech that left art because again, their curriculum changed to a degree that it just didn't make sense for them to offer that anymore. So this is the actual um, description and details of the agreement, terms of the agreement itself. It lists the actual courses that are part of that pathway. It goes through the terms of the agreement in terms of when it was effective. Um, institutions um, agree that all courses must be completed with a grade of C or higher. It's those kinds of detail that are in kind of that meat of the agreement. We talk about maintenance and review. And then we have these signatures and they're broken out by the sector, community college, public institutions, independent and private. And the reason we did this is we wanted to make sure that there was someone at the executive level at the institution that was validating their interest and participation. So, um, you know, we wouldn't want the president be, to be surprised and said, oh, I didn't know we were, 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 were participating in that. So that's the reason for the signature page. And then we start in Appendix A. This is a listing, let me go through this quickly. This is a listing alphabetically of all the community college worksheets.
And then we get into Appendix B, which is the university or for your institution worksheets. And those are alphabetical as well. And then this is where Appendix C comes in. And we list them, we list each of those by each of the courses in the pathway. So this is the equivalency matrix for 2D design. And let me make this a little bit bigger so you can actually see what that detail looks like. Okay. So again, the community colleges are on the left column. The universities that are participating are across the top. The university course is actually listed here. If, if, there's a, um, if there's an exception that needs to be explained overall, sometimes we put a notation here to see Appendix D for all related community, um, sorry, Central Michigan University 2D courses. It's important to note as well that you can participate in the pathways even if you don't offer all of the courses in that pathway. And we denote that based on what you see here for Sienna Heights. They do not currently offer a 2D design course, so we can make note of that here. And in the explanations, we can describe if there's a substitution, if they take that course at the community college, how it's transferred in, as I referred to earlier, whether it's elective credit or something that's a general credit that can be applied towards graduation credit or requirements, et cetera. So this is, um, the next line actually shows that Art 115 at Delta College transfers as a direct equivalency to AD 121 at Eastern Michigan University. So from an advisor perspective, this is very useful in helping the student determine which courses they should take if in fact that student wants to follow a pathway to a specific four-year destination to complete the bachelor's degree. And again, we do that for each course, drawing one, his, art history one, art history two, and then 3D. Now, one thing that we've also footnoted down here is if a community college does not participate, we list those down here. The fact that Alpina, Bay, and Gogebic do not participate in the art pathway. We also list institutions that may be participating but may not offer that course. Course, So MID, Oakland, et cetera, they're participating, but they do not offer that course in the pathway. And then at the very end is the exceptions, where we actually list out the course, the institution, the community college, and in some cases, um, Washtenaw just added a 2D design, that was a new course added, and Andrews has not yet evaluated that for an equivalency. Um, Central, remember, if you if you recall, there was that kind of exception at the very top that was kind of universal. So it explains that here in terms of um, how Central's art programs kind of has an exception or at least an explanation as to how that would transfer in. Does that, I can't remember Shannon who you said that wanted to see that, but is that um, enough of an explanation if you wanted to look at that in detail? Yes, thanks Donna. Sure. Are there and any then, and Go then, ahead, Erica. Donna, Jared, Jared asked how many classes are in the art pathway. Do you wanna scroll up to the top and, and show Jared where the, where the classes are listed sure. in the introduction? So in the art every, pathway, there's five classes. And every pathway is formatted in the same way. There's an overview, and then those classes are listed on that first page of the terms of the agreement. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll just note as well, I mean, I know we said this and this is in the description as well, but we probably had 50 or 60 faculty members together who, who all agreed that their institution the bachelor's degree program required or recommended that the students take these courses in the first and second year. And, and I'll also say um, that it's not like we just said, well, what courses are they? We had a, a big, pro we had these big sticky notes all around the room and people put little post-its on there about which institutions required what. So um, it was, 
I wouldn't, it was, it was a pretty thorough process to be able to get to these five courses. In some pathways, um, like communications has the least amount of um, mm -hmm. required courses. That's only three. Um, I think mechanical engineering is the most with nine or 10 courses, just to give you some idea. But most of them are four or five, six courses. Jared, did you have any other questions or did? I know we're going to have another meeting uh, individually with, with you all, but um, I just, so essentially we're evaluating six courses, let's just say for the arts, we're evaluating the equivalencies of six courses uh, for all 26 plus schools. Is that right? Correct. So okay. um, that's an important note to make that, yeah. you know, you may keep equivalencies for, um, those community colleges that you you know work closely with, yeah. but as part of this agreement, you're you you're agreeing yeah. to have an equivalency for all participating community colleges. For okay. a pathway like psychology, all 28 community colleges participate as an example. So yes, for art, it's five courses, and then two institutions are not participating. I think it was three participation non participating. So anyway, it's somewhere in that range of you know, 25, 26, then you would need to have equivalencies. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to open the document repository? Well, what in, in honor of time, if we wanna keep asking questions, um, let me just go to the next steps. And, and what I've talked about here is that I have been doing one-on-one -on -one, um, sessions. We did an overview session with everyone, and then we're starting to do the follow-up sessions, whether it's related to the Michigan Transfer Network or the Michigan Transfer Pathways. What I plan to do with those one-on-ones, Jared, as, as you alluded to, is to go into more detail, um, more details about the requirements to participate, that you must have an institutional profile, you must participate in the MTN, et cetera. Um, how to access the document repository on the dashboard and get secure user um, permissions, um, how to build course equivalency matrices and what those might look like within the report um, functionality. So those are some of the things that we would do on the one-on-one. -on -one. Um, depending on the flavor of the, the group, I'm happy to open that up and show you kind of an overview. Um, but once we kind of dive into that, it gets pretty pretty detailed and, and I don't want to say complicated because it's not, but it gets pretty detailed, you know, pretty quick. So that might be something to do um, better on a one-on-one -on -one session. Um, I can also mention in terms of next steps that we do have an upcoming workshop in October, which is the next one. And that will specifically look at the MTA and the MTN. And then the fourth workshop is kind of a catch-all or a cover-all for everything that we've talked about and really kind of making sure that there's an understanding among the participants um, in terms of doing that those next steps together. And then, as we've mentioned before, there is a symposium that we're holding next summer where everyone can come together, um, kind of share best practices, success stories, suggestions about what worked well for them, um, perhaps do some best practices of how they've incorporated into their websites, et cetera. Any other questions from the chat, Erica, that would be useful to kind of go over? Uh, no, I think right we're up to date on the chat. Okay. So any other questions, comments, discussion items that I should record for the workshop? Donna, I, I would just add, I think um, the, as Jared was asking the list of the five courses in art, three in comm, four in, in psychology, I think we have a list of all of those courses somewhere. Um, and I also believe at one point you had a list of all of the course department and numbers at the community colleges as well that we were recording. So we have a lot of those resources at our disposal. If you if those kinds of resources are helpful to you to kind of uh, accelerate and make this process as efficient as possible.
I know it's something that we have, and I know it's embedded in each um, agreement itself, but it, it wouldn't be very hard for us just to add a page or add some kind of a resource on the website that it's easy to find. So let me work on that. And that's what I've listed here to develop a list of courses for each pathway to post somewhere. So you're not having to dig for it. I think that might be very helpful. And that's something we can do. So I would like some feedback about, does this seem overwhelming? Does it seem doable with support? Um, I'll give you feedback. Uh, I very much appreciate our one-on-ones. So <laughs> especially as Olivet's jumping into this world uh, even more so, we're trying to dig deeper into making sure MTN and MTA and the pathways is uh, we're, we're up to par or on, on par with what's being expected for our institution and not begrudgingly either. I think that this is definitely going to help us uh, be able to work with students a little bit more or a lot bit more effectively and efficiently uh, and to make sure that we're um, we're collaborating even more so with with the community colleges who I know are are working diligently to help students find their their next journey so after that associates or whatever time however long they're, they're taking and I'll tell you I'll tell you another feedback the the project transfer liaison uh, kind of Excel sheet with everyone's information is extremely helpful. So I'll second that. Uh, just knowing who to contact half the time is the struggle. So uh, definitely uh, thank you for, for assembling that and keeping that updated. <laughs> great, thank you, Jared. That's great information, Jared. Um, one thing too, when we're talking about discussion and feedback that I'm interested in, um, hearing just what are the barriers, you know, like what can be done, how can we help with any barriers that the institutions have with implementing any of this work? I can tell you, Shannon, I know I've shared um, the feedback that I've received during my overview meetings. And I know resources is a challenge that I've heard pretty universally. Um, and sometimes it's just um, competing projects you know, or it's turnover in executive leadership where you're not, where some of the staff aren't quite sure the direction that the institution is going to take or if transfer will become more important or less important. So that's kind of anecdotally what I've heard, but I would love to have anyone else on the call provide um, that detail. Uh, well, Donna's heard all of uh, Kalamazoo College's unique um, <laughs> challenges. Um, I would love to be a semester school and we're not. Um, I would love to use credits and we don't. And I would love to have general education requirements and we don't. So I'm not sure that there's anything any of you can do for any of that. I'll I let Colby and, and Shannon address that. There you go, Colby, you go. Yeah, I think you're probably not alone. Um, we are part of a network of independent institutions across the nation in many states that are diving more into this transfer work, particularly through this grant program. We're not the only state working on this particular focus of more community college transfer to liberal arts institutions and to selective liberal arts institutions, as you know from the institutions on this call. So you're not alone. So it may seem like this big insurmountable thing, which is like, well, we don't have an equivalency. We, we don't work on the semester system. The credits don't work. Other institutions have figured out, we have figured out ways. It just requires some creativity and time. And thank goodness for Donna, who I believe knows everything. <laughs> and no, 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 no. <laughs> it would be Erica. <laughs> and Erica. <laughs> but I think I think it's one of those things where we can definitely work together with you and figure out the best way. I mean, you have had transfer students. It's just a handful, but it's worked. They've been able to have some equivalencies. And so 
I think that there, there are some ways that we can make it, Yep, we can make it work and we're, we are committed to helping. And I know that your president is committed to this work also. And so as an institution, we just have to figure out how we make that equation function the right way, since it doesn't feel like it does right now. But you're not alone. It sounds like it's not gonna work or it would be really such a heavy lift. Um, but I think we can find some good examples that might be helpful. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll double, other... oh, I was Go just ahead, gonna Jared. say, I'll double down. I know Shannon was asking a little bit for uh, other uh, barriers maybe. I'll double down on the resource component. Uh, we have one person on our campus that is wearing 10 different hats that uh, ideally was the person that um, would be updating all of this stuff and working with the MTA and the MTN. Um, now I'm jumping on boards. So now it's two of us, right? And I know some institutions have multiple people and uh, handling a lot of these details and keeping things updated. So yeah, I, I would double down on the staffing resources. But maybe what could also be used as like a something that I was happy about, I guess, is I sat here trying to think and compare myself or our institution versus another institution. And it, I don't think it was helpful, at least as we're starting this, to just sit here and think how far behind we are, but to um, but to take the the one on ones and the um, information one step at a time it makes it consumable and more manageable uh, without worrying that we're we're the last we're last in this race to get this done, <laughs> but more doing it on our on our on our time so that it's done accurately and uh, with only two people doing it uh, yeah. you know, and all the other yeah. projects. It, yeah. it was very helpful to take a step back to, because if you try to do it all at one time, it's that's not right. going to work. Right. But, well said, Jared. Yeah. I will tell you, Jared, to make you feel better that many institutions, the large ones like the public universities or even the other smaller um, independent institutions, um, really only have one or two people focusing mm -hmm. on this project. Um, so, you know, we, that's the reason that we're providing with you with the support and the resources. And, and it's true. And that's what I said earlier in the call that don't feel like you have to do 10 all at once. Let's just yeah. do one so you can get a sense of the process, yep. realize an accomplishment, and then we can add to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think as, as we've been at this for several years, we've learned a lot from, all of the other institutions that have participated in the tricks that they use to make this go a little bit more efficiently um, in the, as opposed to the sort of one-to-one -one equivalency that, you know, that we've operated on in the past. I think some institutions have actually found that sort of automating this in some ways has been very helpful for them. So happy to help with that too. Well, thanks everyone for the feedback. If you think of anything else, we're always, a, you know, reachable by email and um, would be happy to hear more of what you need or other barriers that you've encountered and we can and work to overcome that. So don't forget I'm here to help. And um, we've I've included in the um, PowerPoint, the links and resources that we've included um, the last time. So we will keep this in the PowerPoint this information as well as the recording will be posted to um, the event on the um, website for MCCA. So it's always available if you need to go back and re-listen or look back, um, it'll be there and available. Hi, Ku members, I I'll send you an email after this meeting too with the link. Does anyone have anything else before we close? I just wanna call out Donna and Erica. You both are amazing. So thank you all for your help. Um, throwing that out there. So Shannon and Kobe, I know, I know you see the emails back and forth, but definitely very much appreciate Donna and Erica for your time and your help in all this. I'm very excited. You know, I, I back when I was working full time, I, I was very invested in, in trying to, to find ways to support students and transfer. So for me, this is almost like a personal accomplishment to see so much collaboration and participation at the state level. It's just very exciting to see that come to, fr to fruition, so.
this would not happen without you both. Thank you. I would not. All right. Anything else at this point? Otherwise, we are at the three o'clock hour. Right. Thank you. Good to see you Alrighty. all. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.